Um, if you'll please stand up, we will um, do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Well, we have a guest speaker tonight. Her name is Dr. Daria Wells. She's a psychologist. She arrived to us via Italy, to Chicago, to Boca Raton, and she wants you to know that she's a legal immigrant. <laughs> so we'll just go ahead and get right into it. Dr. Wells? No, I guess I'm not a politician. Thanks. All right. Uh, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. One more thing. If you could silence your your cell phone. Oh, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. so I could speak on, um, I'm speaking this evening on gender identity versus biological sex and how it affects children in our schools. Oops. Sorry, just a little. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> okay. That's good. Thank you so much for allowing to me to speak here tonight. If you're a woman, you have two X chromosomes. They are in every single cell in your body. If you are a man, you have one X, sorry, you were getting my list there. You have one X and Y chromosome in every single cell of your body. You weren't assigned these chromosomes, you were born with these chromosomes. Furthermore, the X and Y chromosomes are not named as such to represent an abstract concept such as X and Y are used in mathematics, but that's their actual shape when you look at them under a microscope. And no matter how much surgery you have, what hormones you're given, whatever happens to your body, you are born with these chromosomes and you die with these chromosomes, okay? So they never change, no matter what. Um, up until several years ago, the word gender was used interchangeably with the word sex. Perhaps it was seen as a more genteel term that wouldn't engender impure thoughts. In fact, the definition of gender from a 1981 Webster Dictionary is rather benign and vague. Uh, it says in the dictionary, could indicate birth, race, kind, class. For example, divinities of uh, feminine gender in literature. These terms are used to also categorize words in foreign languages, the masculine, feminine, or neuter form of a word. Now, however, from the 1979 textbook of sexual medicine by Kalandai, Masters and Johnson, I quote, the way people feel about their individuality as males or females, including ambivalence in their self-perceptions, is their gender identity, which must be portrayed to others or evidence to self. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but this does not clarify one single thing for me. So nowadays, it seems to mean that you can identify yourself and act as any being you want, depending on how it is you feel on a particular day. So for example, if you're a man and you feel like a woman today, you can identify as a woman and compete in female-only sports or use female-only changing rooms. Furthermore, if you really feel like you should have been a woman if you were born a man, you can now get surgery for this. It is in vogue. 
According to Ryan Anderson, author of When Harry Became Sally, this is a great book, <clears throat> and this is how I carried the book around with me because I didn't want anybody to uh, say anything to me. Anyway, um, he said, the Obama administration redefined sex to mean gender identity in our nation's civil rights laws, and then imposed these gender identity policies on schools and health care providers. The transgender cause was officially mainstreamed. In May of 2016, the Office for Civil Rights at the Department of Health and Human Services required all health plans regulated under Obamacare to cover sex reassignment procedures. This directly conflicted with Obama's administration's own medical experts. A month after declaring sex reassignment to be a civil right, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services released a report that they were not mandating insurance coverage because there was not enough evidence that gender reassignment uh, surgery improves health outcomes for Medicare beneficiaries with gender dysphoria. So while Medicare plans, which are run by the federal government, aren't required to cover sex reassignment procedures, which, by the way, are very expensive, um, all privately run insurance companies are required to do so. What kind of sense does this make? All of this trans angst arises from gender dysphoria which the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, explains is a general descriptive term to refer to an individual's affective and cognitive discontent with their assigned gender. I'm sorry, this is political mumbo jumbo. You were not assigned your gender. Now, in the textbook of sexual medicine, the authors write that transsexual surgery is not a cure for this disorder. And while most patients are initially pleased with the anatomical changes, some attempt suicide, some become severely depressed, have psychotic episodes, or want restorative surgery. Furthermore, most homosexuals requesting sex reassignment surgery will not have a long-standing desire for such a change. I want to remind you that we are talking about adults here, not children. So how do these strange concepts affect children and our schools? Activists have been pushing for children from preschool on to be educated about sexuality and to be informed that they can choose who they want to be. They make wild claims that children know even before the age of two what gender they would like to choose. Things have gotten so out of control and bizarre that some children are identifying as different animals. I wish I was kidding. I read last week, and I forgot what state it was, that an official there declared that if someone in a classroom uh, decided they would be identified as a furry, animal control would be called and they would be carted off to the pound. I thought that was a brilliant response. I think we need to understand where children are at cognitively and emotionally at different ages and stages to understand the effects this transgender ideology has on them. Did you know, for example, that a child does not have the cognitive wherewithal to safely cross the street until they are eight years old. But we're expected to accept without question that they may wish to be of the opposite sex and therefore should be. In a lovely publication I used to get monthly when my kids were growing up called The Growing Child, they discuss traffic safety for children ages four to five. They note that four to five year old children around the world are prone to certain traffic accidents. First, they're small. They can't see around obstacles and motorists, excuse me, can't see them as well due to their size. Second, their minds tend to focus on only one thing at the time, 
For example, chasing a ball that rolled out into the street. Third, and I quote, their high emotional states, impulsivity, and inability to make good judgments, such as accurately estimating speed and distance, combine to make them prone to traffic accidents. This is a four to five year old. Don't forget that trans activists claim that kids know even before they're two that they are a different gender. Okay then, so let's start from the beginning quickly. At birth, babies are pretty helpless but observant. They can only see clearly for a distance of about two feet. They recognize their mother by their smell and their hairline. So it's okay to change your hairstyle after two months old. Typically, at one year old, uh, the baby is busy, moves around either by crawling or walking. They pick up many things and put them in their mouths. They can point to what they want. They know their own name and understand simple instructions. And they like to wave bye-bye. Then at age two, they are striving to be their own person and are fascinated by their own will. And so they will frequently use the word no. They are eager to learn and enjoy imitating people. They engage in make-believe play, and they are speaking more. At age three, they can dress themselves, sort of, pedal a tricycle, and they become social. They have friends they can play with. They engage in magical thinking, which can persist to age 10 and beyond. For example, if you give them a sheriff's star and you put it on their shirt, they believe they are truly the sheriff. They can imitate what adults say precisely without exactly understanding the meaning of what they're saying. They pretty much believe anything an adult says. So one day when I was shopping at Costco with my three-year-old daughter, there was a very loud thunderclap outside. And a kindly white-haired man bent down and looked my daughter in the eye and he said, little girl, do you know what makes thunder and lightning? And she got all excited. She said, yes, yes, I know. Two clouds, they get near each other. They have different electrons. And the electrons, they jump back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, till they're even. And that makes thunder and lightning. And this man's jaw dropped. And he said, what preschool do you go to? <laughs> I, I can assure you that my daughter did not know an electron from a jelly bean. She just remembered verbatim what I had explained to her three or four weeks prior and never repeated it before that day. Anyway, at age four, a child's thinking is egocentric. He thinks his point of view is correct and logical even when confronted with contradictory evidence. I think some adults are like that too. <clears throat> at age they can comprehend rules to simple games and the concept of fair play. They develop a sense of humor. Between the ages of 6 and 12 years, children start to become capable of what Jean Piaget calls concrete operations. For those of you who don't know, he was a famous psychologist or psychiatrist in Switzerland and a keen observer of children. They learn by using manipulatives such as beans, and they learn how to add with beans. They can then imagine the beans in their thought and in their heads, but they still engage in magical thinking. That's why in the Chicago neighborhood I grew up in, two 10-year-old boys who had put capes on them, jumped off their garage roofs, did not go airborne. They thought they would as Superman did and they each broke a leg. At age 10, 11, and 12, they start getting argumentative as they begin the logic stage in education. They begin, they begin deductive thinking. Science becomes more interesting. So now that you have this basic framework of child development, is there anyone here who thinks that those under 12 years are fully capable of making life-altering decisions? They're not at all equipped to do this, not on a cognitive or emotional level. All of this gender dysphoria makes for confusion in children from preschool through eighth grade because they are so easily influenced and swayed to be in the cool crowd. Ryan Anderson tells us in his book, When Harry Became Sally, 
that all competent authorities agree that between 80 and 95% of children who say they are transgender naturally come to accept their sex and enjoy emotional health by late adolescence. What about adolescence? What are we talking about here? Anything from ages 13 and up, even to age 26, because in Europe, you still get a student rate if you go to a museum there till you're 26. All right, so the central task of adolescence is the formation of identity. The question here is, who am I? Kids are constantly questioning. And there are forces out there that know this and try to take advantage of teenagers' uncertainty. <laughs> oh, you're a girl, and you're looking at another girl. That's because you have lesbian feelings toward them. You must be a lesbian. Girls that are high functioning on the autism spectrum, formerly known as Asperger's, are very susceptible to being convinced that perhaps they need to transition to become a boy. Autistic kids are hyper-focused on one topic. And if that topic is gender identity, you better believe they get fixated on changing genders and they're very insistent about it. It doesn't mean that's what they really, really want when they grow up. Neuroscientists often tell us that the adolescent brain is too immature to make reliably rational decisions. But we're supposed to expect emotionally troubled adolescents to make decisions about their gender identities and about serious medical treatments at the age of 12 or younger. Activists claim that puberty blocker effects are reversible and harmless. On the contrary, they can result in infertility, permanent brain changes, slower rates of growth and height, elevated risk of low bone mineral density, blood clots, heart disease, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, and a host of other really adverse effects. Interestingly, virtually none of the children put on puberty blockers grow out of their gender dysphoria. Normally, psychologists do not encourage children to persist in a belief that is discordant with reality. Kids have lots of feelings and opinions, but everyone should be cautious not to confuse emotion with reality and opinions with facts. Many kids do that, and many adults do as well. Activists are trying to turn the world upside down and tell us we should learn from kids. More girls transition to become boys than the other way around. Trans ideology undermines years of women fighting for equality. In the old days, if a girl said, I want to be an astronaut, a teacher would encourage her to study science, mathematics, etc. Now they might be told, you know, maybe you really want to be a boy. Do you feel like a boy? What a big mistake that would have been. Jordan Peterson, who is a Canadian psychologist, has an interview on YouTube that I strongly recommend you watch with a lovely girl who had a double mastectomy at age 15 and then at age 16, she changed her mind about transitioning. Now, how does this trans ideology affect our schools? Schools used to be a place where we sent children to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic, along with a few other academic subjects, such as science and history. Now it's a place where kids can turn a harmless fantasy into a harsh and harmful reality. What? This puts teachers in a terrible position of playing psychologist, medical physicians, and God. They are not trained to do this. Schools in other states are unsafe for girls. I am sure you've heard enough on the news about bathroom issues, locker dilemmas, etc. in other states. I thank God I live in Florida and Ron DeSantis is our governor. The following is a law that everyone thinks is called the Don't Say Gay Law. It is actually the Parental Privacy Act. Classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in pre-kindergarten through eighth grade except when required by section blah, blah, blah. If such instruction is provided in grades nine through 12, 
the instruction must be age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in according with state standards. This subparagraph applies to all charter schools. Did anybody hear anything in that act that was anti-gay? Anybody? There's nothing anti-gay about it at all. Lastly, there was an article yesterday in the DailyMailUK.com about a 29-year-old son of a famous photographer that due to life circumstances became profoundly depressed. He saw transitioning as a way of killing himself without actually dying. He stated, I could be an entirely new person. He believes gender dysphoria is hugely overdiagnosed. He seriously entertained suicide suicidal thoughts. After meeting with a psychiatrist for a total of 10 minutes via telehealth, he was diagnosed as transgender and prescribed hormones. He said, thank God I didn't do the hormones because within a few months you're risking infertility and the thought that I could not have children is devastating. He continues, but it also shines a light on the uncomfortable reality, which is that we are asking kids ages 15 and 16 to make the choice about whether or not they will want children themselves, and that just isn't right. It's almost like society has a gun to its head, because if they are not supportive of it, the only choice is to be canceled. You're either for it or you're transphobic, and there is no middle ground. Folks, this is called all or none. It's a cognitive distortion that many people have, and they apply it to many other things in their life, okay? I think the whole country needs cognitive behavioral therapy for this and other distortions that they persist in. Um, personally, I can't add anything else to this young man's comments, and I thank you all for being such a patient audience. Do you have any questions? Yes. Why is this transgenderism and all the other isms, why are they allowed in schools? Why are they what? Allowed in the schools. I mean, they're a disaster anyway. I, I think, I, I mean, I, I can't answer that. I think there is, I got. Or is, or is it us, the parents and the activists, that to stand up and say, no, we're not doing this? Yeah, the parents have to be very much involved because if they're not. Because they're not. They're not. And they're in California, involved. they could threaten to take your kids. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm a retired doctor, uh, but I have a question regarding the presence uh -huh. uh, and the awareness, but also the presence, the voice, and the power behind the psychological associations, the oh. psychiatric associations. You seem to be I'm one of very few that have spoken up. Um, Oh, if they can't other. hear you. Why don't you bring the mic? Yeah. Um, there you go. So, I'm just curious as to why there's been, look, the silence has been deafening in the medical community. I don't care at what level it is. I don't care if you're trained in psychology or not, psychiatry or not. At the very least, um, suicide prevention type of associations, nobody is speaking up about the reality of what you discuss. Now, are there other sides to the discussion where transgender, those that chose to do so, and that might have needed it, whatever, are bullied or you know suicidal because of you know the way they're shunned, whatever. But we're talking about what, what you're yes. talking about, and the silence is deafening, and I want to know why that is the case. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican, Democratic, Muslim, Every community that I've been, you know, what I'm saying, I've been reading and hearing and going to podcasts, I've been with other doctors that are, yeah. you know, discussing the emptiness. Of, are they afraid to speak up because of the uh, professional risk of your own license? Um, I can't one speak the for field? them. Hmm. Um, when I graduated, finally, got my dissertation done, um, <laughs> and my husband was stunned to hear how many dissertations there were on uh, gay issues. He said, I, I said, I didn't know I went to school with so many 
you know, gay people. I didn't know that. So they are now the powers that, that run the thing. I, I don't belong to APA. I have not belonged to APA for many years because they seem to jump on the bandwagon of whatever is popular now. And I think, I think it's criminal, frankly, as leaders in the, to, to, to okay this. Um, uh, bullying, anti-bullying programs, I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about bullies and anti-bullying programs. At least as of five years ago, none of those programs were based on research. None. Okay? So in other words, they had one program, uh, they said, oh, bullies, uh, they're bullies because they have low self-esteem, so we're going to raise their self-esteem. A few years later, somebody did research and they actually found that bullies have too high a self-esteem, well, so they made yeah. the problem worse. <laughs> right. So. There have been a lot of things that they didn't do research on. I mean, even at the turn of the 20th century, uh, you know, there were British psychologists that were advocating not, not hugging your children because this was spoiling them. Don't hug or kiss them. I mean, how could you do that? And the only other thing I feel very concerned about is the autistic community. Exactly. They're at I mean, very, very high I risk. I work with them, mm -hmm. and I, the kids as they are are exposed and abused most of the time, or neglected most yes. of the time, this is understood most of the time, and now we have the risk, yeah. forget the sexual traffic, right. now we have the risk of this. Right, and if it's you, I, I highly encourage all of you to go on YouTube and listen to Jordan Peterson, he's excellent, and he's been censured in Canada, by the way, um, and he has this interview with this sweet girl, and I, I felt, and she is on the spectrum, um, she's what we used to call Asperger's, now they call it high-functioning autism. I prefer Asperger's just because it really separates it. But you had asked a question, and I made five copies of this, I don't know. Um, I don't know why I get this, because I never send them any money, but I get this <laughs> publication from Hillsdale College. Oh, Hillsdale? Yeah, yeah and it's called In, Inside the Transgender Empire. And I'm just going to read you a real quick paragraph here. There is a great project of transgender movement. No, this is the great project of transgender movement. To abolish the distinction of man and woman, to transcend the limitations established by God and nature, and to connect the personal struggles of trans individuals to the political struggles to transform society in a radical way. It's really scary. And it talks about uh, Pritzker, one of the Pritzkers is the governor of Illinois, um, and one of these Pritzkers was a trans and donated tons and tons of money to this movement. So I think money underlies a lot of it. But as far as psychologists not speaking up, yeah, I, I think they're afraid. Look at J.K. Rowling. She's a billionaire, so she could speak up, but still they pillared her. And all she said is, yeah, I think you're entitled to your opinion. You don't need to be pillared. I think part of the problem today, like you mentioned, people are afraid to talk yes. or to talk up. Yes. I happen to be an author. I write a lot of books, and uh, we all, nobody, everybody's afraid to make a choice. So I, I happen to like Trump personally, and uh, I lost a lot of friends. Yeah. And somebody asked me, almost, you know, you're in the business with people. I go to lectures, you know, book signing events, and uh, look what's going to happen. I said, what's going to happen? Half the population is not going to call like me. They're going to call me uh, like Waters, a scumbag, mm -hmm. or like Hillary, a deplorable. Mm -hmm. They are deplorable scumbags. Mm -hmm. But I'm no better than they are. Then. <laughs> but the point is that most Americans are not. The point I'm trying to bring out is that people are afraid to take sides. And yes. I, here was my attitude. If half the population doesn't like me, and so far everybody loves my books, you're talking about children, I think people underestimate children. Yeah. I really do even so I agreed with, with everything you said. But I made a choice. I said, okay, if half the population doesn't like me, you still have 160 million people. Mm -hmm. So if only 10%, 5%, 1%, mm -hmm. I still do very good. So I made a choice. And yet, when I go sometimes to, to uh, the book signing event, and somebody doesn't like what I said, I look up and look and I say, hey, that's your problem, not my problem. Don't 
tell me how to think. Same thing with children. It, yeah, it's a free country. Exactly. Like, you know, we can all have our opinion, but to shut somebody down to cancel them is wrong. Right. I'm sorry. Oh, I couldn't cover part. everything, believe me. Yeah, There's no, so much. Because you said that, you know, the money, you know, but it's a huge, I mean, it sounds like conspiracy stuff, which, yeah. you, which oh. you mentioned, which is true, that's behind it also. Yeah. But there's also, which is why you don't hear from the other psychologists, because they're there. They're actually saying things, mm -hmm. but it's being suppressed. Mm -hmm. They're being censored, they're being, you know, mm -hmm. shadow banned, whatever. Okay. You, you don't hear, you don't hear them, but they're there. And, and I, I've seen the reports, I've seen the interviews, and, and one of the big things is that, you know, they're making a huge fortune off yep. of these operations, yep. and, and by promoting it, and then the fact is the studies show that, you know, the, the justification is allegedly that it's supposed to reduce the suicide rate, basically, for people on the, right. on the spectrum, but it doesn't. That's it, right. It's it, it, the suicide rate does not change, so in which right. case the, tre the treatment is, is, is not is not valid. It's pointless. It's not. It's not, not. There's nothing increased, but they're making a huge fortune off of it. It's a huge, huge it's fortune. Right. It's a. It's an industry. Yeah. It's an industry. The hospitals, the doctors, and all these and people I, and involved. I just, I just it think is it. an industry. And then think and about they it. They think like like car manufacturers. Yeah. I mean, it's they're not dealing with human beings. They're little. To them, these kids are objects. Uh, anyway, and, yep. and, and, and the more and they want to reduce the population. They're they're very yep. vocal That's about fine. that. Yeah. So you know, if you have all these transgender kids, so they, they can't reproduce. Right. So 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 it's it, you know it, it helps it helps that yep. agenda. Right. Th th and then we replace them with it. those people that are coming through the border in the south. Right. Why? So it's a, it's a very good replacement, you know. We well, have a, that, that, that's part you know, of a lot of Democrats are coming exactly in through the border. For, but, uh, but, you know, yeah. and you can't have Asperger's anymore, by the way, because they took it out of the DSM. Yeah, so I know, but it's I a great way. To, it's a great way to get cured. They just, just take it out of the book. Yeah, well, but <laughs> like, for example, I prefer manic depressive over bipolar just because it sounds like more fun. So, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. No, but it is it's a huge industry. I have a question regarding sure. sports and Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yes, I have a granddaughter who's small and she's into archery and if she ever wants to compete and a guy comes along and says he feels like a guy that a girl that day. Yep. Do you think that the pendulum will swing? Do you think they're going to I I can't predict the future. I sure <laughs> hope so because that is just Ridiculous. That Leela Thompson, and by the way, if you talk to a Democrat like last year, they they never heard of Leela Thompson. I'm just like, like, what are you, what are you watching? And I don't even watch TV. I just I read this stuff on the internet. I, and I'm sorry to be really kind of gross, and but this guy, mm -hmm. if he was really committed to being a female, I'm sorry, he should have hacked off the male member and really showed the world he was committed. He didn't. Well, you could see it through his bathing suit. Well, you could save the peace in formaldehyde. <laughs> Can't reach it. Yes. People are saying, like, how did it get into the schools? You know, it was very surreptitious. I mean, they slowly educated the new educators, the people that were in the um, education departments, the teaching. The colleges. Teachers. Yeah. Right. The colleges, teaching right. teachers. Yeah had a very skewed left-wing point of view. Yep. And they felt that they were changing the world for the better, and they probably still do feel that way. And so when they were asked to develop the curriculum as the experts, right? The people in, who are educating the teachers are also considered experts in educating children. They yep. wrote up curriculum that built into it was their world view. Yep. And that's how we now have a whole generation that it between, what is it, between 18 and 24, they're like more than 50% against Israel. Yeah. And if yeah. they're like 25 and up, yeah. it's more like 80% pro-Israel. I may have the, the numbers off a drop, okay? Mm -hmm. But what happened right there? That's when it must have hit critical mass, when That's the teachers that are teaching oh. were totally steeped <clears throat> in the world view of the oppressor mm -hmm. and the oppressed, Right. and that Jews uh, were 
adjacent yeah. white, as they're called. Adjacent, adjacent white, white, right? Because let's face it, up until uh, maybe 50 years ago, it wasn't so white for us. Um, anyhow, okay, I'm just yeah. gonna say that it seeped in, it was slow. Mm -hmm. People uh, with uh, good intentions thought that having more diverse opinions in the education department was good, but then as those PhD yeah. professors got tenure and hired the next layer of professors to come up under them, they didn't see that having a broad spectrum of opinions was so good, and they hired more professors that were only in their own ilk. And it's very hard to find, I think, I, I won't go out on a limb and swear to it, but that there's a Republican professor in any education no, department in the country. I'll be shocked. The, yeah. the teachers, and I'm a professor, teachers have generally been very much on the left. And this is not exactly a new issue, right. because if you think about it, it really goes started back with the sex education. And then how many times do they have to teach it to you? I mean, let's figure it out. I mean, a square peg in a round hole, that's hard. A square, but a round peg in a round hole, how hard is it to teach a simple biological fact? And, and, and from kindergarten up and, and in health, in gym, in science, in biology, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I mean, the teachers need to be fired for being so stupid that they can't teach a simple biological fact. I mean, you know, going back to the money, you should think about something that you said. You said about Obama, and that under Obamacare, so the federal government, Medicare, they don't have to do this. That's right. But the private health care, yeah. right, talking about private, you know, capitalism, free market, sure. where, which, what they did things which we know kill insurance. You can't cross a state line. That kills the insurance. The Havari is spreading around the, 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 you know, the, yeah. the damage. Private insurance has to cover it, but the government doesn't have to. Yeah. Think about that contradiction. Yeah, and there are 45 clinics as of a few years ago across the country that were performing sex change operations on children. Mm -hmm. Said because I would love to know the statistics and some of the biology that you refer to. She wants to know the biology and statistics. Like, yeah, yeah, the, thing, yeah, the copy of my that, yeah, talk. Yeah, sure. And then <laughs> the other piece is um, about trans. Yes. So one of my colleagues had a very um, religious, I'm, I'm very religious person that wanted to go trans, but he loved his family. Um. So she was working with him on his issues, and as they started becoming resolved, he, he realized that that was a way for his mind to try to escape <laughs> the pain that he was in. Exactly like this. Pain, yeah. Yeah. Right, and so, you know, <laughs> I wonder how many therapists are aware of that. Well, in Europe, in Europe it's, quite squashed right now, the transitioning. Yeah, Because they actually are following the science. Even the very liberals that really? initially went wholeheartedly yeah. in, like Sweden, I think, maybe a few Holland. other countries. Holland. Now Holland. they are pulling oh, yeah. back. Yeah. I'm gonna finish my point, thank you. They're pulling back now from uh, doing transitioning because they followed up on their clients that they transitioned and they are not finding that it made a better outcome not a better outcome. And so now they don't um, pay for it and they're um, questioning whether or not they should be enhancing. Um, that's Europe, which most of us think is ahead of us. Right. Socially, anyhow. It was Holland. Okay. The, origi the original studies were done in Holland and it was also with the autistic and they thought that they would, you know, it would curb, it would counteract the suicide rate. And then they realized that it didn't, so they stopped. But the, the Americans, you know, like, 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 like the APA, these people, they went and took that study, the initial study, yeah. not the follow-up study, but they took the initial study and they ran with it. And you keep on asking them, well, why don't you look at the follow-up study? And you keep on getting this, uh, you know, answer that, that you know, they, they yeah. just, which then it comes back to the money. They yeah. want the, the money on the operations. Yeah.
increase. Yeah. Yes. Um, so our, <coughs> excuse me, we went to uh, UC Berkeley for our grandson's graduation, oh, and boy. it was a very scary place. The students were telling me that they were afraid to say the wrong pronoun the professor, because one day they feel like a man and the other day they feel a woman and they use they and I don't know, all kinds of pronouns. It was really scary. I have to tell you, that was my panic when I saw that you had to use proper pronouns because grammar was my pitfall. I hated grammar. I'm like, oh no, I would have had to know what a pronoun was at that age. There's no way I could have done that, you know? I would probably get shot if I go there. <laughs> well, there was a student in Wisconsin that got suspended for sexual harassment because he called a girl that wanted to be a guy the yeah. wrong pronoun. That's a shame. That's awful. And it, they rescinded it after it became public and they common sense prevailed. But first they were suspending him for sexual harassment, mm. which yeah. would go on his record. He was in eighth grade. Oh, that's awful. I, I don't know why they call it common sense because it's not common. It's not common no, it prevailed who calls not it. to do that. No, no, I know, but common sense is called, you know, it sounds like a lot of people have it, but they don't, and it's a little scary. So it's uh, a misnomer. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Am I an XY? Pardon? You are XY. XY. Absolutely. Oh. Unless you have an anomaly. <laughs> I mean, there's very few of those I didn't. I assure you I don't. <laughs> so we have a few candidates. Um, Dr. Page, Mike Lutsky, um, Jody Schwartz, and then um, Jessica Jansen is going to talk to us. So we'll start with Dr. Page. What do you say about the educational system in this country? I get the product of K through 12 every day in my classes because I teach on the college level. They're not prepared. They're too busy worrying about their hair or their, their boyfriend or their, I want to be a boy today or I want to be a girl today or whatever, everything but academics. And it's not the kid's fault. We have a broken system in the educational community in this, in this country. And it's been that way for a long time because I've done this for 30 years and counting. And I have seen courses dumbed down. And this started back in the late 1800s, as continued. John Dewey and his merry band of whatever you want to call them, communists, nut jobs, left-wingers, progressives. There's lots of names you can call them, but that's when it started. It hasn't stopped. It's gotten worse. And all these laws that our governor did pass, he's done a great job of, of passing about 250 laws. School board's not going to pay any attention to that. School board says, nah, bye. We'll do exactly what we please, when we please. Try getting a budget out of them. Can't do that. But I will tell you that the superintendent makes $340,000 a year. And that's just his base salary. And I see teachers in, in the Dollar Tree reaching into their pockets to buy supplies they need for their kids. So it's up to us. Parents, the Bubbies, the Zadies, activists, up to us to stop the school system. Because all they're doing is damaging our children. I want what's best for them. They deserve to have a top-notch educational system in this country, and we don't have one. They have $5.2 billion budget. And, and people say, oh, well, we had an A-rated a, a school system. Not, not, not from where I'm standing. It wasn't an A, now it's a B. Well, when you're terrible at A, how do you get more terrible? But they managed to do it. Our kids deserve better. And I'm running for the board because I had a long talk, a lot of prayer went into my running. And I've been told this, you must do this for the children. So I'm doing it for the children. I'm in it. I have, I have no business to offer the school system. I have my PhD in economics from the University of Illinois. I have 30 years in county experience in the classroom with the kids. I wear two hats. I have my disciplinarian hat and I have my paternalistic hat. And I use both of them. I've been a dean, an associate dean, a program director, an area coordinator, a vice president of real estate development, 
I was with the uh, city of Boboton for 10 years, and, and I was the economist planner, and if you look at some of these environmentally sensitive properties in the area, I was the project manager and writing the grants. But I love our kids. I'm doing it for the love of them. I want to see them successful. They deserve the best. They don't have it. We need to change it. Please go to votesuzannepage.com. Help me out. Get me on the board. Thank you. What does your shirt say? If you voted for Biden, you owe me gas money. <laughs> but you owe me more than that. We can't see it. That's good. I love that. Yes. Great shirt. It's true. My, my chief of staff bought me this shirt. Very good. Nice shirt. Good shirt. Do you have a question? Yeah. Should have worn my shirt. How, how do you propose to change the system? What, what do you, well, oh, what do you that, think that, you that's can an do? excellent question. Yes. The only way we're going to change the system is to unite and, and badger these politicians. All right, once you get in, what, you get, what, 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 what do you think you can do to make this different? Initially, I'm going to be talking about how the kids are treated and how the, the board is not doing their job, how they don't care about the kids. They're not going to like me. They didn't like me in 2020 when I ran. They called me the disruptor. I only had a month of campaign because I was drafted. And I took that month. And, and I, I went after Barbieri because that's what I was running against. And um, I took over 40% of the vote away from him in one month. They called me the disruptor. And I'm going to do more disrupting this time. Yes. Because we are going to band together. And I have a big mouth when it comes to our kids. No kidding. No. <laughs> you know this? Thank you. And, and another thing, I was talking to Sam Sorbo. Thank you. Thank you. No, I could do. Oh, syllabi have to be changed. Laws have to be followed. And, and I don't know why they've got anything, anything dealing with sex education, transgenderism, you know, health in biology and, and reproduction in biology as a source of, as a part of the curriculum in biology, not how you insert something. We don't need that. None of that belongs in there. We need the three R's. We need community values, family values. We need to instill confidence, self-reliance, personal responsibility. And the rest of it is, and that's just starting with the, the um, foundation, which I call the educational schoolhouse. K through five is the, is the foundation of our educational schoolhouse, and we go from there. But we have, to, we have to band together. We have to unite, because there's safety in numbers, and if we all start squawking about the same thing at the same time, it'll ch it will change. Is it going to happen overnight? Absolutely not. No. It took us since 1899 to get in the mess that we're in, we are in now. So it's not going to happen over overnight. I wish I could be like uh, Samantha on Bewitched. You know, she, she tweaks her nose and everything is perfect. Unfortunately, it's not. But it's going to take a while, but we can do it. But we have to work together. And we're going to have to get on the backs of these politicians. You, you want to be reelected, and you're going to do what we tell you to. You take care of our kids the way they should be taken care of, not what, what some transgender person or, or uh, um, some teacher playing doctor or psychologist. Last time I checked, you had to have a, a license to do that. Yeah. And they're, they're not doing it. They're practicing medicine and not having a license. So that's illegal. And, and then if you go down to the Boca Library, the main library in Boca, there is a section in that library where none of us could go in that section because you have to be between the ages of 13 and 17 to go in there. I, I call those minor kids. So gee, what's in that section of the library that they don't want us to see? Well, when you have an imagination like mine, it runs wild, and I don't like it. But they keep it a secret, or they try to. But I have people out looking for things. We, we don't need this. There are. Children do not need to be exposed to adult situations. No way, no how, no where, no school. If, if someone in this room took a, 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 a copy of, of uh, Hustler and showed it to a 13 or 14 year old, that's illegal. You'd be arrested, as you should. Our kids are babies. They need to be protected. Yeah, yes? Don't, don't you think your view is a little old-fashioned, given the prevalence of the internet? I don't think kids have to go to the library to see dirty pictures. They don't, but why do they have to be in the library? Why does it have to be restricted? Why can't parents know what's in that, that section of the library? Why can't educators know what's in the section of the library? Why can't voters know what's in that section of the library? What's wrong with that section of the library? Did you ask the librarian if you could inspect it? Yeah. And what they say? No. What was the reason? 
Oh, you, no, this is restricted for, for uh, students. Uh, no, no, 13. that's when they're in the room. But what if they're not in the room? Could you go there at opening and say, I'd like no. to... Why? They, Why would they, they will not... But you're a taxpayer. Will. Thank you. Well, I, I, I find that hard to believe. Well, you find it hard to believe, but that's what's going on. Yeah. All right. All go right. visit the library, please, sir. The library. Go to the library. That's what's going on. You know, years ago, if you had a blockbuster, okay, um, and... and you wanted to see an X-rated film, fine. I, I'm not for censorship, but you want to see it, it was segregated, there was a gatekeeper there, you had to show your ID, you had to be 18 years of age or older, fine. This is the same thing. Thank you. you were looking for logic. And, and it's up to, the, it, you were looking for, yeah, I know, I look for logic too, but you don't get it. Right. But, and it's up to parents to police what their children see on the uh, internet. Now, You know what? A lot. Look, a lot of the parents, and I, I get it. A lot of parents are uh, they're afraid. Are they going to bully my kid? Are they going to suspend my child? There's one child suspended what 38 days in, in um, uh, Boca because she wouldn't wear a mask after the governor said you don't have to wear a mask. Frank Barbieri says yeah, you're going to wear the mask. They do what they feel like, and they've been getting away with it. Time for them. Enough is enough. Time for them to stop getting away with it. But we have to stop them. Oh, oh, that, that too. That too. But a lot of those people aren't voted in. The teachers aren't voted in. They're, they've been given a job. The superintendent, but I don't think he's voted in either, right? I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, I don't know if the superintendent, but a lot of these people, that, these are, you know, you talk about the swamp. These are people that are appointed. They're, you know, yeah. they get a job. Well, they're, they're not, it's not like they were voted in. It's no, not but the they, they, they were not voted in. Well, the board was voted in. Absolutely, you have to vote for those who are happy. Yes, yes, you do. You've got to change it. We have to change. We've got the opportunity to change it. 2020, this August. And that has to be done first. I did, yeah. 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mike Lutsky. Hey everybody, my name is Mike Letsky. I'm your proud school board candidate for Palm Beach County District 5. That's right where you are right now. It's Boca, West Boca, and Highland Beach. I'm an aerospace engineer, serial entrepreneur, and I served in the Marine Corps. Now you already heard that Palm Beach County School District lost its A rating. It used to call itself highly achieving a rated school district. And now it's a sad, sad B. Because this school district is not focused on academic excellence at all. I will make our school district education great again. I will raise teacher pay to livable wages unprecedented before by being a stopgap in this county. We don't need these expenses in the district on construction, every $51 million translates to $4,000 pay raises for teachers for 12,572 teachers. We don't need the Amazon fulfillment center styles that we're building. We don't need the Taj Mahal on Forest Ave. We don't need 90 new cameras for every 1,200 students. It's an overuse of technology. I will safeguard our schools by adding more law enforcement, a better contract with PBSO, metal detectors at every entrance at every school, because this district isn't doing enough for school safety, and cameras with artificial intelligence that detect weapons in the parking lot before they ever make it into the building. I will never back down when it comes to parental rights or protecting our children from inappropriate content. And you can trust me because my kids are in these schools and every decision that board makes, and that board doesn't make any decisions because it's run by the administration, directly impacts my family. 
I will be the stopgap. I'm not there to be a team player. I'm there to fight for the teachers and protect our kids. I will pull out every consent agenda item out for discussion. I don't care if the meetings take three hours, three days, or three weeks. I'll buy them all pizza and I'll order the bus with the showers on it because we're going to be there a while. I wasn't recruited by any political party to run. I'm the guy from the community that's lived for 15 years, that's owned three businesses, that saw this school district for what it is, the most poorly run business of education in Palm Beach County I've ever seen in my life. I'm disgusted by it, and I'm running to change it for the better of our community. People move to Palm Beach County, they expect great schools. We don't have them today. I will make them great again. Thank you. Support my campaign. Vote Letsky August 20. We can't lose to the progressive school teacher from Delray. I won't accept that. I'm all in. I'm do or die on this. Vote Letsky, support my campaign, let's win. Any other questions for you? Are you both on the same board? You and the... We, we are running for the same seat. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. How long do you think that the change will take to be effective? Every board member on that board today wants to have the shortest meeting possible. The first meeting I'm there, I will let them know either we're doing this the right way or the long way. And I'll ask, I'm an engineer, all I do is ask questions and I love data. They can't bury me with it. I'll keep asking. The only thing that I can control on that board is the clock. Why? There, I'm a director on the board, so it's Robin Rules of Order. For, for Mission Bay, I'm a director, I'm on the board. So I know how boards work. Okay, you get motion, second motion, discussion. I'll discuss everything, 100%. Any other questions? No, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And then we have Ms. Jody Schwartz running for state yes. committee woman. That is always the first thing I say because no one ever knows. You're absolutely right. So again, Jody Schwartz, state committee woman for Palm Beach County for the Republican Party. So what a state committee well, committee woman does is we actually will, or I will, I should say, will be the liaison between Palm Beach County and the state RPOF, the Republican Party of Florida. So I will be representing all of the Republican voters in Palm Beach County. So by definition, anyone who's registered Republican is a member of the Republican Party. So we want to make sure that all the voters know that, all the voters feel connected to what's going on at the state level, and they feel engaged. So I'm going to be the source of information, I'm going to be here on the ground, I'm a very grassroots activist type of person, because a lot of you know who I am, I'm around, and if you don't yet, please come and introduce myself, I'd love to talk to you afterwards, um, and throughout this entire campaign. So my uh, position is, it would be voted for on August 10th. Right now, I don't have any opposition, so I'm hoping that it stays that way and I could just slide right into the role and start representing you as quickly as possible. And it really is very important that we have someone very strong and we build community and we build relationships and we open our tent and everyone feels included. And the only way that we're going to be electing more and more Republicans and get stronger at the local level, all the way from the local level through the federal level, is to have stronger force behind us on the, on the ground. And I hope to be that person to help bring us all together and make you feel connected to me and me connected to you and you feel connected to the Republican Party of Florida and Tallahassee. Even though it's really far, as far as it can get practically in the state, we're really close in this world and we're going to make sure that we all feel connected to that. So, Jody Schwartz, uh, Palm Beach County State Committee Woman. My website is jodyschwartzusa.com. So please come check it out. Connect with me, call me. I'm actually my parents. I have a place in Century Village, I'm here a lot. So please, you know, whatever you need to do, I'm here for you. Thank you. Thank you.
I do, actually. Yeah, I have my guards. I'll hand them out. Thank you. Do you, do you have a geographical area, or are you for the whole county? It's the entire Palm Beach County. And how many so. committee people are there, like yourself? Well, well, there will be one woman and one man for the entire county. Is that so by law, one man and one woman? It's Yes, by statute from Florida. Yeah. What if you're indeterminate? What do you mean? If, if, well, if you've listened, I think you know what I mean. Well, <laughs> well if you... if. You, a Democrat or an MPA? Is that no, 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 no. <laughs> X, Y, or oh, X, X. Oh, oh. Yeah, we're Republicans. We don't talk about that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, we talk about that. But that's actually why we need strong Republicans in office. We need to make sure that we build a strong, strong team and push that out so we have common sense. <laughs> is there a question in the back? Yeah. OK, go ahead. And Jody is a uh, force of nature, and we're really lucky. I'm so excited that she's going to be our council committee woman. Committee woman. That's and that's, that was what I wanted to say. Testimonial. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. OK, so this is very lucky, what she just said. You are a wonderful human being. What did Thank she you. do? Well, she also has run campaigns for people. She is just, when there's a need to be filled, she'll do it. She doesn't try to find someone to offload it onto. And um, just okay. amazing. And recently, she's also revamped her look. And now she's very elegant. She used to really be um, salt of the earth. Not just let me, salt of the earth. And now she looks quite elegant. So yes. I hit 50 in November, so I had a little bit like midlife crisis this year. And so I, I didn't know your everything. parents-in-law lived in uh, in Century Village. This is news. They, yeah, they moved here, I think, two years ago. They got a place. So to tell you a little bit, that was a great question, though. I didn't really talk about who I am and what I've done, so I appreciate that prompt. So I have been working on campaigns in Palm Beach County for the last four years. been very, very active. January of 2020, I kind of fell back accidentally into a congressional campaign. It, politics was always a hobby of mine, and I decided to kind of volunteer a little here and there in January of 2020, and ended up loving it so much that I jumped in completely and full time. I was a stay-at-home mom for about 15 years, so I had the time to be able to do it. My kids now are 15 and 18, so they were a little older, didn't want me around anymore, didn't need me around, so I was looking for the next phase and realized that politics is gonna be the next phase of my life. So for the last four years, literally 15 hours a day, seven days a week, has been focused on politics. So I really, really focus on it. It's I kind of obsess about things, and this is what I'm obsessed about now, and then hopefully in the next 20 years. So I've worked on several congressional campaigns. I've worked on local campaigns. I was a member of the REC for the last three years. I was the deputy director of elections operations in 22, and in, in November of 22, and in March of 23 for the municipals. And I worked as, I called it air support for all of the Republican candidates, candidates in all of Palm Beach County. So I was helping them on the ground, making sure that, like, like you said, exactly, I was at the polls for the couple weeks before the polls. I was doing uh, text messaging, I was doing flyers, and all that kind of stuff. I really was just kind of blanketing the, the, the um, entire county with the director. What's that? Well, yeah, thank you. No, there was a big, there was a team. There was a lot of people. There was down here in Region 5, we have Jessica Jansen, who's now the regional director of the South County for the REC. So it was her and everyone else from the South County that we kind of all grouped together. But I will take a little credit of organizing it, but mostly it was because it was an amazing team of people and really great volunteers. Um, and we had a director of election operations who I worked with. Also, so that, that was a team as well at the REC level. So it's really, it, I really have been kind of engrossed in the political world, I'm very, very active on campaigns and candidates in the last few years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Um, Jessica? Thank you. 
Rest assured, I am not running for office. You're all safe. Um, thank you, Jody, for that little shout out. I am the South County Regional Director uh, for the REC, but I'm here in another capacity tonight. Um, you may recognize me. If you don't, I have a local podcast called We the Locals that I have with a couple friends of mine. We highlight uh, things that are going on in Palm Beach and Broward counties. We let people know exactly what's going on in your local governments and the candidates running for office. We do our best to give you great information, educate you, and give you enough information so that you can then take the information we give you and do your own further research and be able to make good decisions at the ballot box. So if you are interested in listening to us, we are the first and third Thursday of every month. Um, and it starts live at 7.15, but all of our episodes are re recorded. You can catch us on Rumble or you can catch us on YouTube. Um, but we love to just educate people and empower them and engage with them and just make sure that they're as informed as possible. Um, as we went through this journey and I was <laughs> in that group that Jody talked about, um, we got very heavily involved in some local campaigns and realized that it was very difficult to get information about things locally. Our local media focuses on hot button topic issues and they don't actually attend a lot of the city council meetings or county commission meetings. So we kind of do that and be able to kind of give you like a bullet point version, give you um, bills that are going through the house or um, the Senate and just try to get you as educated as possible with quick, easy reference information. Um, and that's what we're all about. So if you need a card, if you want to check us out, we'd appreciate any support. And just watch, like, subscribe. Um, we do accept donations on our website as well. It's personally funded with the three of us. So um, any help that you can give and just get yourself educated and really get yourself educated before municipals. Um, since you don't necessarily have a municipal here because you're on the west side, um, you can still get involved and help people that do live on the east side. So please check out your candidates, make sure we have good representation locally, and we do that with We the Locals. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Do we have any other candidates? No? Okay. Um, we have a local author here, Amos Knoll, and I'm going to give him a few minutes to talk about what he's going to do. Yeah, I got your flyer here. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. My name is Amos Snow. Let me get one thing out of the way, because usually people ask me what kind of accent I have. Yeah. I was born in 1943 in a little place called Israel. That's my Hebrew accent. And when I was five years old, I moved to Austria, Vienna. That's my German accent. And when I was 10 years old, I moved to Brooklyn, New York, so I have a Hebrew, German, Brooklyn, Jewish accent. But that's out of the way. Yeah, I'm not a PhD, I'm not a doctor, I'm just a simple old man. What can I tell you? I love to write books of inspiration and motivation, and my books are not politically, even so I am very much politically. I'll give you an example, just of two, three books. The book, Max and the Red Headed Dragon. There's a message in it. You're talking about kids. Don't judge people by the color, gender, lifestyle, or the way they look. Judge people only what's in the heart and mind and mind. Hello there, and mind. And inside, by the way, that's the way it gets mailed. Inside is the book. And when I write those type of short story, I try, I try to include, if I get the speaker in here, I try to include pictures in it, in the book. Because uh, when I go to a book signing event, kids love it, so I, actually, so I actually write the books for the parents and the kids. Uh, last year was, I forgot which one, I went to an uh, old age home. They were mostly elderly people, obviously. And they loved the pictures. They could read some of it. Even so, I have it, even so, I have it in, in uh, in 16 font, font, they're very big. So this is just an example, and, but, and I can give you all uh, whoops, the flyers. Another book, another book is Mama Weimer Black. First thing, wow, everybody looked at me. Who the hell are you? 
Well, last year I read the book to, uh, I think it was a Delray, there were mostly black kids and uh, intermarriage. The book is very, it's a very simple story and it also has uh, beautiful color pictures in them. The boy asks his mother, Mama, why am I black? Not white like you. The title is Mama, why am I black? And the mother explains it to him. Iskinder, you were created from the best of your mother and father. That's why you have some beautiful, that's why you have such beautiful red hair and blue eyes like me. The mother from Eastern Europe. And the father is from Ethiopia. He has brown skin and wavy hair. And the mother explains to him, you were created from the best of your mother and father. That's why you have such beautiful red hair and blue eyes like me. But and beautiful brown skin like your dad. But most important, that's why you're so handsome and smart. And as I was reading it to the kids, first I remember walking in and they looked at me like, here's a six foot four white dude walking in, <laughs> type of attitude. I was laughing to myself. But as I was reading them, I could watch the, I love to read in front of the audience. I watched the kids' eyes just open up. I actually got water in my eyes watching them. Now, one of, by, by the way, I have about 70 books. <laughs> one of the books, books right now, talking about woke, it's called The Chubby Conqueror. This book doesn't have any pictures. It's just a book, 200 pages. Hollywood is working on the, on the screenplay right now to make a movie. It's, we have in America an obesity epidemic. We have over 250 million of us that are overweight and obese, and 25 million our children, and there's no end in sight. I happen, I happen to be also the founder and chairman of Children's Obesity Foundation, which is a nonprofit 501c3c. So while I work on the screenplay in Hollywood, I met one of the directors, and he walked over to me, and he started telling me about all the work and all the stuff he wants. And I made it very clear. Listen, I don't care if you're black, if you're white, if you're gay, if you're lesbian, God bless you. But don't try to shove it down my throat or my kids. That's my attitude. Because we're all equal. If this is what you want, God bless you. But don't tell me how to live. They didn't like it. So I told them I'm going to do the book here. And I'm putting a syndication together. I told them I'm going to do the book here in Florida. Well, they were very upset. I said, well, it's my book. I write my books. I print the books. I do everything on the books. So you're not going to tell me what to do. And I have already a bunch of bakers that want to come behind me on that. But all my books are really written for not just children, because if you read the words in it, it's for children and their parents. Because many times, I know you might disagree with me, the kids do learn from the parents. I'll tell you a cute story. In the book, uh, which one? I think it's Mama Wima Black. It's a true story. Max. In the book, Max and the Red-Headed Dragon, where are you, Max? He's actually my great-grandson. And he was living with me because his mother died. And uh, we were raising him, my wife and I. Now he's 13 years old. One day I'm lying on my bed, because I lie down like I need catnaps, but I get up at 4 in the morning and go to sleep about 2 o'clock at night. Even as a kid, I didn't sleep much. So he comes down and lies next to me. And he puts his, you know, he puts his head between my couch and uh, my, my shoulders there. And uh, he said, Papa, can I lie next to you? I said, sure, Max, no problem. And then I was just lying, relaxing. So he gets up very quietly. He goes to the television and puts on the music instead of the news. Uh, news, Max. <laughs> on Fox News. <laughs> and uh, then he goes and gets his blanket which is about five feet. No, he was about five years old. Yeah, I was five years old. And he tries to cover me. And I, I mean, I wish I had a tape. He tries to move the, move the blanket up, my feet. <laughs> then he goes down, he goes back a few times. So finally he left it in the middle. Then he walks over to me and he kisses me on my forehead and says, Papa, I love you. And he walked out. Now, every night, for all my grandkids, I used to tell them stories. Give me a subject and I'll just make up a story for you. 
And uh, when I went to the living room, I asked him, Max, why did you cover me? He said, and changed the music. He says, Papa, I wanted you to have the most ultimate sleep and rest. That's from a little kid. The point is, our kids learn for us, the parents, the grandparents, the aunts and uncles. Now, what I told Anna what I like to do, I've been doing a lot of charities, for example, for Herzl Hospital, and that's for the wounded soldiers in Israel. As a matter of fact, I understand they're trying to set me up a, a book signing event at Mar-a-Lago, and it's going to be for Israeli, wounded soldiers, and American. And I think General King's going to be there too. And what I told her, it says, if you want to have an event, get all the people you want to. I can have a book signing over here, 40% of the proceeds. And somebody asked me on books like that, how can you afford giving 40%? Well, since I'm doing everything, I don't have three, four middlemen, I can't afford doing it. And then I would go to, to your organization, which of course will help you out. So if you want to set up a meeting, let everybody know, and we'll have a book signing here. Any questions? I put off my whole lifetime in a few minutes. Thank you very much. So our next meeting will be February 27th. We thank you for coming today. Thank you, Dr. Wells, a very informative speech. And I think we all learned something today. Um, we, we need to unite, we really do. We need to stop this insanity, it's ridiculous. So thank you for coming and I hope to see you next month. Um, yeah, we'll be here again. Uh, February 27th? Yeah, we'll be here. Okay. Yes, yes, we'll Seven be here. O'clock. Pardon? Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Okay. 7 o'clock, Tuesday. It's always the fourth Tuesday of the month. <laughs>